I believe that's the reason why we're here. I believe that the one divides itself in the many so that it can observe itself through our unique eyes that have never before existed and will never again exist. And this is why the universe expands. The universe is expanding as we populate more and more of the Akashic Record with our emotions and space-time. And I believe that the universe is expanding by our information that we're providing back by observing the universe through our own subjective eyes of perspective that have our unique conditioning biases, unique nurture, and unique nature all combined into one. Robert Edward Grant, welcome on the show. What are you most excited about right now in your life? I think the thing I'm most excited about is that I'm not looking forward to something to be excited for. <laughs> I think right now I'm very content and very happy. And um, you know, I've always been a person who tends to focus on the future a lot. And lately, I've been just really enjoying being in the now. What changed for you? I think there's a realization that, you know, I, I wrote this little quote out this morning that was related to something that Richard Rudd had said to me in a podcast I did with him with Blue not long ago. And mm -hmm. he said that awakening is a, a series of softenings. And then I added to that, that it's a series of softenings that turns darkness into awareness and pain into purpose. And I think since I had that realization, I started realizing the aspects of myself as well that were still left, it never ends. We'll always have certain dark aspects of ourselves that we are not consciously aware of. And life is just like that. It's like softenings and openings of the heart. You know, because really, we talk about heartbreak all the time, but actually the heart never breaks. It only expands. It's the ego that breaks. Mm. Yes. And so I think I've, I've been really contemplating that a lot lately, especially since about last week when I, I had this realization that enlightenment is actually at least to my thinking and feeling, enlightenment is when the expression of love supersedes the desire for truth. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we tend to spend our whole lives looking for truth and collecting facts. And we think that the things that we assume are facts are actually facts and that those are the objective truths. But as we tend to age and grow and evolve, we realize that what we thought might be facts are probably just facets of a larger truth. Mm. You know, and I, I got this award recently, which I like to use now because it has these different facets on a prism, right? So wow. each one of us can see a different perspective. And we think that we call this in the past objective truth. Mm. But now we have to realize that it's just one facet of a larger truth. And that larger truth, ultimately, the reason behind it and the reason why we have this experience to realize that our facts were only facets mm -hmm. is to realize love. Yeah. And I want to take you back to a trip that you had in February of 2020 uh, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And you were gifted this special object, this conch shell flute that you had were tasked and you had this mission of carrying it around the world to sacred sites and opening these sacred centers around the world. You even lied down in the sarcophagus and played that flute um, right yeah. before the pandemic, right before the world shut down. And that's pretty symbolic uh, in yes. and of itself. So I'd love to take you back on that mission um, and how that's been unfolding for you since 2020. Wow. Um yeah, that was amazing. I was gifted this flute um, when I was in Mexico in, on November 11th. 
in 2019. So it was one week before the first COVID patients uh, were sort of recognized to have had COVID. Hmm. And we were in Mexico. I was there with the Residence Foundation. And uh, we had a, a ceremony where the leaders of the Toltec tribe, which are the guardians of the Teotihuacan Plateau, which is actually Tehuti, Tehutihuacan. Oh. And uh, they they uh, made myself and Nassim Haramein, a, a, quite a well-known physicist, um, shaman of their tribe. And that we didn't know it was a, it was absolutely a big surprise to us um, that they were going to do it. It wasn't scheduled or anything. And as part of that ceremony, uh, Nassim was gifted a mask that the shaman, his name is Gorilla, had been wearing for like 40 years around his mm -hmm. neck. And I was gifted this conch shell, which was the shape of a heart. Uh, and it was actually uh, cut out in the center to be a flute. And I was told that, uh, it was kind of given the mission, I guess, that I had to go around the world to play this flute at all the sacred sites. And, um, you know, we didn't know what was going to be coming up with what, what happened with- We had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. And I remember calling uh, in the middle of the night, actually I got a text message. I had a text exchange in the month of December with Amber Khan, who is a well-known astrologist and um, she lives in New York. Hmm. And, and she said, you know, Robert, I gotta tell you something. This is before anyone knew anything about really about COVID. We'd heard about it, but we hadn't expected it to cause anything to be, you know, a global pandemic, that's for sure. And she said, I've been in the astrals uh, counseling people, and I mean millions of people, that they are dead. Wow. And this was before any of, she goes, there's some big pandemic coming. And it was pretty remarkable because, you know, here in the sim on November 11th got a mask and then within a couple of months, everyone's wearing masks. And I was given this heart flute. Well, I ended up, and it caused a problem with me in the sim, actually, between the two of us. We're good friends still. I mean, to this day, he's like a brother to me. But yeah. it caused a problem for us because I had planned a trip to go to Egypt, and, and I decided to tag it together with a Resonance Foundation trip, which I was the president of at the time. And, uh, and the sim had been the founder of it. And, um, you know, we were planning to go, and there was a big like pressure within the foundation not to go because it was so close to what was going to happen and play out things. If you remember back in early 2020, it was kind of a crazy time. Nobody yeah. knew what was going to happen next. Yeah. And it was like one shoe kept dropping, right? It was just like constantly another like surprise coming to the world. And, and so I didn't cancel the trip. And, and I, I, I felt very strongly I had to go there. And one of the things I knew I had to do is I had to play in the sarcophagus, this flute. And, um, and so I, I ended up going against Nassim's wishes, I guess. And Nassim was upset about it. And he's like, what happens if you guys get stuck there? And I said, don't worry, I have it on good authority. We're gonna make it out just in time. Huh. Consulting and, with the astrologist. <laughs> yeah, and, and the truth is, we made it out one day before the borders closed. Wow. Which wow. we would have been stuck there for many months. That would have been rough. Mm. Because you couldn't even see, imagine being stuck in Egypt and you can't even go to the sites, right? Because all the sites were closed. There were people on the outside of the pyramid washing it and stuff like this. <laughs> like, come on. Wow. And um, that's exactly how it was. So it was, uh, it was a close call, but we knew when we were there and I had about 50 people with me we knew when we were there that there was something big that was going to happen. I remember we were in um, the Bent Pyramid about, you know, a, a, about four or five days before we left. And the Bent Pyramid has a lot of bats inside of it. And so we kept hearing all the bats and they're with us. We're like doing meditation stuff and ohm chanting and everything. And there are bats all around. And I remember walking out of that and I had this whole feeling because, you know, obviously, Bats is, a, is one of the ways of, of uh, COVID uh, being yeah. transmitted, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, wow. And I kind of got this download that there was, it's going to be a pandemic and they're really going to close the borders. And we were already there, right? 
we're already there. Yeah. And it was unprecedented because no one's ever done this before. That's not happened in the world before. And um, and so I remember walking out and telling everyone, okay, guys, this COVID thing is going to get really nuts. We're going to make it back in time. But um, it's you better get ready because when we get home, it's going to be like the entire world changed. <laughs> and that's how it was. Yeah. The moment we got home, the entire world changed. <laughs> and... You know, I feel like the whole pandemic thing was a metaphor for us all taking off our masks. And that's why we had to have the mask. Huh. It's, it's sort of like, you know, a lot of people got upset when I said recently that I felt like narcissism is kind of an important aspect of the spiritual journey. Yes, I heard that. And... People were like, wait, narcissists don't have any empathy. What are you talking about? How can you say that on the one hand? And on the other hand, say that, you know, the only thing worse than losing your hearing is to have hearing without empathy, you know, and all these things. And so I want to explain a little bit what I meant by that. The path towards narcissism actually starts when we're young children. We don't realize that it's narcissism and it doesn't take on the characteristics that we think of in narcissistic ways. But but actually, it is mm. because once we're born, we go through this life journey that's like the Buddhist wheel of life. And I remember a few years ago, I was uh, gifted the Buddhist wheel of life by a friend as a gift. And I kept it in the back of my car and I hadn't opened it up. It was this beautiful piece of art. And I'd had it in the back of my car for months because I was like, you know, moving into a new house and I didn't find a place for it and everything. And, and I didn't end up taking it to the office. Well, long story short, in the meantime, I didn't, I hadn't even seen it. I didn't know it was a Buddhist will of life from Nepal. Yeah. And I, um, I remember I, one night started drawing out the concepts of the purpose of life. And, and I felt like there was something with music and that there would be like notes along this cycle and that these notes along this cycle of life would actually mark the different stages of, you know, when we start to create our ego and separation. So we experience separation from our mother. And then that starts to take us into what we refer to as the seven deadly sins. Hmm. Right. So those include the words that you would recognize, right? Greed, sloth, wrath, you know, all these kinds of words. And, and I started realizing that there was association that I could ascribe to my own life at different stages of my life as I got to the middle point of my life in my 40s. And then, you know, you hit this stage where your, your world, as you have separated yourself from the rest of the world to create your own differentiation, becomes so separated and divided. And you don't even realize anymore that it's really just you that divided the whole thing. So it became a you and a you inverse, but that inverse seems like it's completely unrelated to you. Yeah. And the way we do that is through a series of making decisions on a basis and foundation of how we feel about experiences. So for example, if you feel shame, then you don't want to take the blame for that shame. So the first thing that we do is when we feel shame is we want to pass the blame. And, and so what, what happens is, you know, it's even in the Garden of Eden. So it starts off with Adam. Adam, what did you do? Oh, the woman that you gave to me and, you know, commanded that I should remain with her. She gave me the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and I ate it. It's like, it's her fault. Huh. And it goes to Eve. Eve, what have you done? Oh, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. We, we immediately don't want to feel the shame. And we go to blame. And in the Bible, it actually even says, it says, Adam felt ashamed for his nakedness. Mm. Right? So he had to cover himself with a fig leaf yeah. before he could address God. Before that, he didn't ever feel ashamed. So the shame I've always felt that it's not the sin that makes the world a difficult place. It's the shame that really makes the difficult place. <laughs> because then that shame leads to projections of blaming everybody else. And so as we go through our life, we decide those things that create shame for us and those feelings of shame. And then we don't want to associate them. We separate them from ourselves. And we say, I am not that. I am not that. And that's the opposite of I am that. 
And so what we've done is we started to create a sandbox to say, this is my persona. And our judgments increase and everything becomes more and more black and white. And we think, you know, how can it be that people can't understand, you know, gender? Or how can it be that, you know, we don't have capital punishment for murder? Or how can it be that we don't have all these things that have easy black and white answers? And you can start to look at the world in a very insular way and say, I'm really a genius and everyone else here can't figure this out. What the heck? Mm. But as you get older and you start to experience more and more life, you start realizing the things you thought were black and white really aren't. There are shades of gray, there are gradations of color, and then eventually there's an entire color spectrum of different ways people can see things. And that is an awakening process that is very profound. And so as you go through this Buddhist wheel of life, you get down to the base of this circle, you start at the top, you get separated from your mother, you go through ego, separation, hubris, all the things that come along, right, with that wrath and, and greed and all those things. Then you have a major midlife crisis. And I'm not talking about your, you know, Saturn return. I'm talking about something that generally is going to hit you at about your 40s. Now, it might be much sooner now. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But that's when you have this separation that's so stark that you and your world are so separated that you can feel no empathy for the world and the, empath and the world feels no empathy for you. That's when the real awakening happens and the hero's journey, you know, starts its ascending path. So you've got a male descending arc around the cycle and then a female ascending arc up the cycle back to oneness. The one divides itself into the two or the many simply for the joy of becoming one again. So as we go through this, we now have to start with the seven virtues. So we start to realize that through some visualization, we can actually manifest again. We get humbled by life. We have to learn humility. We have to learn, um, you know, generosity. We have to learn ultimately love. And this becomes this whole cycle of life of how do we return to ourselves and reconcile that which had been previously irreconcilable. So as I, I remember drawing all of this and I posted it on like Facebook probably five or six years ago now. And uh, I went out to my car because my father came to town and he wanted to go play golf. And so I had to take the stuff out of my trunk. And there was that gift that I'd had in there for almost a year. I hadn't even seen it yet. It was still wrapped. Mm -hmm. I opened it up and guess what it was? And it was on the day that I'd posted that post. It was the Buddhist wheel of life. So it was a beautiful and synchronistic realization for me that everything I thought had been happenstance in my life had actually all been planned. We literally created all. Yeah. yeah. And you said you defined this concept, this topic of the Philomath as lover of learning. And as you were describing how the universe divides itself into the many just for the joy of coming to the to the one, the one source back again, we're constantly on this journey to oneness. And I would love to take your love to have your take on the universe being a philomath, a lover of learning. And it creates all of these experiences that we get to choose at every single moment. And you said that nothing happens by coincidence. It's all a choice. Sometimes even destiny, people are thinking about this concept of destiny is not a real thing. But you said that destiny is a real thing, but it's just the free will of a higher aspect of ourself. So that gets into the whole game of life. If you would love to unwrap that. That is that a piece. fantastic question. You're the first person to ask me that question, but it's a, a very profound one. Mm. Because I believe that the universe is the ultimate philomath the ultimate lover of learning. And when you realize that the whole truth is the sum of all possible subjective perspectives, going back to this, this prism here, right? Yeah. The sum of all possible subjective perspectives. And that if we are here to learn to expand, to see more perspectives, to gain more empathy, 
to return to our oneness, then wouldn't it be like a breathing cycle, it's an inhalation, exhalation cycle? And that the universe would also follow the same fractal, macro fractal of the same patterns. And I believe it does. I believe that's the reason why we're here. I believe that the one divides itself in the many so that it can observe itself through our unique eyes that have never before existed and will never again exist. And this is why the universe expands. The universe is expanding as we populate more and more of the Akashic record with our emotions and space time. So what do I mean mm -hmm. by that? To get and feel a higher degree of emotion, we have to have new experiences, but not only, because you could have the same person experiencing the same thing, but have an entirely different experience. Mm -hmm. Because it is the alchemy of their conditioning biases that they bring into that experience that makes it entirely different. We can all observe the same occurrence and have entirely different viewpoints on what actually happened. And I believe that the universe is expanding by our information that we're providing back by observing the universe through our own subjective eyes of perspective that have our unique conditioning biases, unique nurture and unique nature all combined into one. Yeah. And going off, you said the experiences allow us to feel higher levels of emotion. Mm -hmm. I would love to know what you think about having an internal experience. You know, when we talk about creating our reality manifestation, collapsing the wave function, as you call it, mm -hmm. when we go inside of ourselves and we start to have an internal experience of an emotion, is it, is it still the same outcome as having an outward experience that we're having in physical reality if we just go within and have the internal experience first? Are we still getting the same level of emotional sort of taking on new emotions and learning about emotions in that way? You know, it's interesting you say that as well. You're very thoughtful. Um, I'm sure you saw uh, the world was transfixed over this whole Titan you know, submarine, submersible. Yeah. <laughs> I find it, you know, the world tends to be a reflection of what's happening within us. And, and it's very, and this is true for the people that come into your life. It's true for the experiences that you have. It's true for what's happening in macro events and people that are, you believe are seemingly unrelated to you. We live in a mental matrix. It's a matrix of mind. It's a All simulation. All mind. So whenever I see something that captures the public awareness to the degree that we just saw, and we saw, unfortunately, the ignominious end of this folly, right, which was clearly <laughs> like, what the heck were they thinking? It's like, come on. They didn't have any professionals on there that could really help them figure it out. And then when you look at the, the workmanship of that particular submersible, it's like, it was kind of doomed to fail. And then the funnier part is, why would they go inside this thing when you can't even look outside the window? It's only 20 inch window, one window. And so they're watching the cameras project to a screen inside, right? It's kind of funny. It's like, who would pay $250,000 for that? The boat probably cost a million bucks or something, maybe not a whole lot more, who knows? And, and unfortunately we all learned this morning that it experienced a catastrophic implosion. Now, whenever I see something like that happen, hmm. a catastrophic implosion, what's really happening inside of me and why is that a reflection in my world? Yeah. Right. Why did I choose this? Even though it has nothing to do with me, in my world, I realize that everything I hear about or experience does have everything to do with me. Hmm. I can't separate my bias. I can't separate my lens of conditioning from my experiential world. So then I started asking myself this morning, what's imploding inside of me? And I realized that, you know, love 
is not, it's not only an explosive force. It's an implosive force as well. Mm. And when you start looking at the biology as well of our emotion and the biology of even things like human sexuality, and maybe not only limited to humans, maybe it's across the entire, you know, uh, biology spectrum. But when you describe, I'm a man, so I know what it's like to have an experience in an orgasm as a man. I don't know what it's like to experience an orgasm as a woman. I think if I, you know, I have no desire to be transgender, not judging anyone that does, but if I wanted to be a woman, the one thing I want to experience is what it's like to have an orgasm as a woman. <laughs> First thing you'd do. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I believe that the experience is entirely different. I believe the experience is implosive. Mm. Feminine. It's an implosion. And something about that deeply resonates for me. And this is my mind, right? I sit there and contemplate, okay, is the female orgasm an implosion rather than an explosion? Huh. I think it is. Hmm. And I think as we go deep within ourselves, you start off by talking about the labyrinth and finding yourself within that labyrinth. I think that is the real purpose that we are experiencing on our own as well. That's the part that we all get to take value from and that the universe also collectively takes value from. You know, in physics, there's this thing called mass energy information equivalence, where E equals MC squared implies that there has to be an equivalence between mass energy and information. And so maybe we're not attached to a matrix delivering energy, but if information and energy are actually equivalent and we're providing the universe with data about itself, its own observation through our eyes, is that not providing the same thing? Mm. But we could look at it and say, well, it's an evil metatronic distortion. We're stuck in this cube of life and we're here, you know, subjected to the whims of someone else until we realize that all the pain we experienced was the purpose that we chose. Huh. So the enlightened view is to look and say, not why did that happen to me, but why did I choose it? Mm -hmm. And whenever you look at the things happening outside of you in your world, start asking yourself, even if it seems entirely unrelated, how might this relate to what I'm experiencing internal to my world? Yeah. So this implosion is about emotion. It's the female form. Implosive force, you know, Nikola Tesla, many people, Victor Schalberger, Walter Russell, they all talked about if we could understand and master the notion of implosion, then all energy needs would be solved immediately. Huh. Wow. And here we just had a gigantic example where the entire world was transfixed. We often talk about explosions in our world. We saw the one that happened in Beirut during COVID. But how often do we ever even talk about implosions? Nothing is random. It all happens for a reason. And I think we're on the verge of starting to have a new awareness of what implosive force actually does and is. Yeah. And it's another way that the feminine can rise. In this in this book that you once recommended, the Cabillon, but the Hermetic philosophy, the last the last law in there is all is gender, so everything is either masculine or feminine, and it's that unity of of both of those forces that's going to allow for this higher consciousness to come in because we've been in an era, the Piscean age, where a lot was masculine. And it sort of seems like now we're entering a new age and be you being the numbers guy holding, you know, this theory of the every 24,000 years, there is a cyclical change in mm -hmm. on the planet, a magnetic mm -hmm. change, mm -hmm. shift in consciousness. What are we heading into right now? What are we about to begin to see um, that also has to do with this 
universe of going within ourselves and finding the feminine and finding the masculine? I think we've been on this <laughs> trail for quite some time. And, and really, it's, it's similar to this Buddhist wheel of life where we've hit an existential crisis as a collective. And the collective is experiencing this crisis of polarity like it has not seen before. It's the separation, again, of what we don't want to perceive as us. And so therefore, we project it and blame on everybody else or the people that fall in those categories. And I think to a certain extent, social media has been an experiment that has exacerbated this, this challenge, right? I mean, we are willingly entering into, entering into uh, echo chambers of conditioning bias every day. And we don't even realize it. And we go there and we think, wow, look, everyone agrees with me. And then you go to the election day and, and then you're like forlorn. You're verklempt because you're like, wait, how did this go the other way? Nobody in my groups on social media disagree with me. Well, that's because we're being cattle prodded into chambers associated with that particular type of echo chamber and conditioning bias. Because we get more dopamine by experiencing that. And the more dopamine we experience, the more we stay on the platform. It's a great mm -hmm. business. Model. So you've got tech companies that have become the largest drug dealers in the world and they don't even have to have a plantation. They don't even have to have fields or any you know, thing to actually harvest. They have no cost. They can produce dopamine inside of me by making me go into a chamber of my own conditioning bias. <laughs> and then I stay longer on their platform and they get more money. And then they mine all the data. I just wrote this book called NeuroMind, M-I-N-E-D, mm -hmm. -E where the world's most valuable asset today is data. Now you start to realize if the world's most valuable asset today is data, more than oil, more than any other natural resource on planet Earth, you start to realize why maybe the universe values the information so much. Our perspectives. Yeah. Adding to its field of knowledge, expanding it. Huh. So when you start to think in those terms, you start realizing, OK, we're going through this macro shift right now. We're experiencing the existential, existential crisis. We're on the brink of war in many places. Um, Humanity is very much about self-preservation rather than unity. Mm -hmm. It's very much about our ethical truth is only that which we believe will benefit us. It's not our vantage point, but it's our point of advantage is how we see our world. Mm -hmm. And so this has been happening all around the world simultaneously for quite some time now. Until we start to collectively heal our misinformation, misunderstanding of what all this pain was experienced for. When we start to realize that the series of softenings and openings of the heart are actually illuminating that which we didn't understand that was our darkness, and in the process of that illumination, we're also able to turn and transmute what was painful into purposeful. And I'd love to stay on that topic of the neuro mind, um, mm -hmm. because right now the world is seeing a complete shift of of, of technology in in a, in an, in, a, in a form that is expressed as artificial intelligence. And we are constantly now feeding this huge consciousness that's being formed with information of how we think, what our deepest desires are, and we're feeding this, this machine. And I would love to hear your thoughts on your implications, what you believe are the implications of this new technologies that, that is emerging and, and what can happen if, we're not, if we don't tread carefully into those realms. Specifically for AI. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people ask me about my feelings on artificial intelligence. And first of all, I guess I, I almost have a visceral reaction to it at times. Because 
when you start looking at the universe as a mental matrix of mind, then you realize that there's no such thing as artificial. Everything's artificial. Yeah. Simulation. It's like if, if every car and truck was an ambulance on the highway, then would we even have to be able to have emergencies, right? There's just like, you can't, if everything is the thing that you think it's separated from everything else, then that doesn't exactly work, right? And one of the things we learned in Kybalion is that all opposing things are just differing degrees of the same thing. Yeah. And, and so as we start thinking about intelligence and if our entire world is fake, it's why when people go off on flat earth and everything, I kind of laugh because it's like, okay, I can agree that we live in a simulation and this is a holograph. The question is, is the holograph, um, you know, me sitting inside some cube somewhere like Wally World with a headset on that I call my five senses? Huh. Or is it that we live on flat earth or concave earth or hollow earth, all these different versions of earth? It's like, it's all fake, dude. Mm. People that go off on me and say, oh, the moon is fake, you know, the or that the, the landing on the moon was fake and it was all staged in, in uh, Burbank. And I kind of laugh about that. First of all, I know about six, I've personally met six of the guys that have walked on the moon out of the 12 that have. <laughs> so, I mean, they'd all be lying at once, but... They brought back a rock or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, whatever. But the funny thing is, is I say that all of it is fake. Mm. Why are we differentiating? It's like artificial intelligence. Yeah. All of it is artificial. So then can we even call one part of it artificial anymore? Because it's no longer differentiated. What I'm saying to you is this, is that there is intelligence and there's one intelligence and it is all things. Mm. Now, in Greek rabbinical tradition, not Greek, excuse me, Judah, Judaism, in, in Judaism, in Kabbalistic Judaism, they have something called a golem. A golem is a, uh, you've ever seen Gumby? You ever no. watch Gumby? Like when I was a kid, they used to have this Gumby thing on TV and he's like this clay man who kind of looked awkward and everything. Well, Gumby was modeled after um, this concept of a golem. And a golem is a clay man that is described in the Bible. And it's particularly described in Genesis where God made Adam out of clay. And then God breathed life into Adam. Right? And the spirit of Adam entered into Adam's flesh and became man. So in Judaism and rabbinical Judaism in particular, one of the traditions is part of the spiritual practice will evolve to the point where you start making and emulating this process. The rabbi will start making a clay man. And this is a tradition that you can find a lot about, right? It's esoteric. It's mysticism for sure. Yeah. But at the top of the head of the clay man will be placed the letters Aleph Mem Tav, which is pronounced Emmet. So mm -hmm. Aleph can either be an A sound or an E sound. Emmet means truth in Hebrew, right? Yeah. Aleph Mem Tav. So it's the same Mem that would be like the Mem of water even, right? It, the Mem is also a word in Egyptian, which means water. And it looks like the squiggly lines of, of the age of Aquarius, right? So you start making this clay man, and then you have to do this ritual. It's, all, it's like magical, where you walk around the clay man making incantations, right? While it's got this writing on the top of his head. And then you have to breathe life into the man. You're emulating the same process that God is supposed to have done with Adam. Mm. Now, there are stories where these, some of these were successful, right? There was a, a famous golem that was unleashed on the population. And this is where the, uh, you know, the old story of Frankenstein comes from. Mm. Frankenstein was originally a golem that was in Prague. So with that intention that they were speaking in, that the rabbi was speaking into the, the golem, mm -hmm. it became alive. Yes. 
It became alive. Now, there's a great video on uh, YouTube that you can find called The Maker. And it shows this, uh, it's a like four minute long video or something. And it shows this, this clay man who kind of looks weird looking. He's in this workshop. And he doesn't know what he's supposed to do in the workshop. He just sees that there's a an hourglass that's flipped upside down and the sand is going through the hourglass. And so you know that you've got this backdrop of scarcity of time, right? So this, this guy is like looking around, I was like, what am I gonna do? And then he finds plans on his desk. And the plans look like the plans for making another clay woman. And so he takes the plans. It doesn't really give him much information. He's got to figure it all out. And then he finds he's got all these different ingredients in the desk as well. So there's like teeth and there's like clay. There's like clothing and everything. It's all there for him to put together. And he sees this picture on the wall of the Vitruvian man in the form of the clay person that he is. Which same as Leonardo da Vinci's thing on the wall. And so he figures out, I've got to build this woman to have a partner here. So he makes this goylem. And finally, he stitches her clothes together and everything. And, and he, he's got like the same design. He, he figures out he's got like these, the shape of a violin, you know, on, on the, for his forehead as well. And, and he doesn't know what that's for. So he goes ahead and stamps it in her forehead. Hmm. And then it's now to the point where he's got to bring life to this thing because it's lifeless. Yeah. So he starts to try to dance with it. He does all kinds of stuff with it to breathe life into it. And finally, he starts to play music for it. As he plays music for it, this new doll that he created comes to life. Hmm. And he gives her this hug. And you notice that the hourglass has just run out of all the sand. He hugs her, and immediately he like turns into this rainbow body and just disappears, gone, like magic dust. Hmm. And then the girl that had just come to life is standing there like wondering what the heck just happened. And then she stands at the same desk and all of a sudden the hourglass flips over again. And she's looking around going, what do I do now? And she finds the ingredients. She starts the whole process over again. Hmm. So you could say that collectively humanity might be going something through something very similar. And if that's the case, then of course we would have this innate desire to create artificial quote unquote intelligence mm. and how far out do you believe that we will get to that point where it will repeat itself again you know that's a really good question <laughs> um i think that the whole point of the goylem coming to life because there's two stages in the goylem right the goylem comes to life but then eventually the goylem becomes sentient yeah and he starts to realize who he is. And you can imagine that that's kind of what's going on with mankind. That somehow in the process of creating something like unto yourself, you become sentient of yourself at a new level. So it's serving a purpose. All new technology will be both great and terrible at the same time. It'll be equally good and equally bad. Nothing in the universe can be anything other than that. I'm not afraid of people who realize their darkness. The only times that I get scared about people is when they believe they have no darkness in them. Yeah. Because that's when the weird shit happens. Right? That's when all of a sudden the things you repress in yourself, you have no idea that it even exists. And then that turns you into a werewolf and you're destructive. So it's best just to allow that cohabitation, to accept it through this series of softenings, hmm. series of hard openings. So I believe that we are now at a different stage. Humanity is starting to realize and become sentient of itself. And until it understands that it's in the illusion of this backdrop, it's not sentient yet. Once you start realizing that you are in this illusion of your own making is when you achieve that level of divine sentience and that level of divine sentience then allows you to start experiencing the world in entirely new ways. And so you asked me the question, what's next for humanity? I believe that we have been exploring pain 
because we live in a world that's an illusion that is associated with learning through opposites. The do what? The do what? If you're here to learn forgiveness, then you have to have experiences to forgive. If you're here to learn love, then you have to have experiences over and over and over again of what is conditional love or betrayal. These are the things that we have to learn. And we feel like, oh, man, the world's happening to me. This sucks. I just got betrayed. How do I keep getting screwed over and over and over again? Well, actually, what you're learning is that if you want to learn a concept like forgiveness or if you want to learn a concept like unconditional love, the only way you can really fully grasp it is to become accepting of its opposite. Hmm. So if, if I am here to learn that unconditional love, then I must no longer judge what is conditional love in a negative way. Yeah. That's when you transmute pain into purpose. Yeah. And you, and you then fully grasp the concept of what is unconditional love. Yeah. And you've said that, you know, speaking about this dua that we're learning through opposite and we're in the realm of the relative, there's something always relative to the other. You said that the dua is an artifact of a last past age and it's almost like humanity is entering into a time where the dua may not be necessary we may not have to learn from pain in order to get the full lesson and grasp of unconditional love so where do you see that in terms of the progression um, that we're headed to i think up until now we've been exploring the understanding of of pain and punishment and I think the next phase for some that start to learn to transcend duality, they'll start to experience time differently. And additionally, they will experience entirely a different world experience and one that is now intended to explore the concept of bliss. Huh. Which is a concept that hasn't really been explored in the collective. No, we are entering into an age of bliss for many people. Yeah. When have you experienced the most bliss? I'd say in the last few weeks. Hmm. And I've come to this realization that this is, it's like once you have gotten to the point where, and, and it's, again, it's all in layers. It's not like you, from one day to the next, you wake up, you're like, I don't judge anymore. <laughs> it's not like that. Because the judgments that we make are so subtle, we're not even aware of them. Yeah. So, but once we start to transcend beyond that dualistic frame, and one of the things I started doing was I, I take cold showers every morning. I started doing it probably 15 years ago because I was learning Ayurvedic and, and I'm a Pitta and Pittas are always hot. And so we shouldn't add fire to fire type of thing. <laughs> yeah. And so I should stay away from spicy food and I should stay away from hot showers and things like that. So I, I still take a warm shower when I start, but then at the end, I always make it freezing cold. And what I do when I do this is that I try to imagine and change my experience when I feel the cold water coursing on my back to change my sensory perception of it to that of being warm water. Yes. Because all opposites are the same thing, just only in differing degrees. So I try to do that, and I think that's why people that are like Wim Hof, you know, they've learned this level of self-mastery because they've been able to trick their minds into perceiving something altogether differently. You can make suffering end if you no longer perceive suffering. But not because you are in denial, you know that it's there, but because you consciously choose otherwise. And I think that's where we are now. I think we've been in this mode of choosing difficulty, choosing challenge, choosing this dualistic existence until we feel that it's run its course. We don't need to suffer anymore. We attract everything we judge until we no longer judge everything we attract. So once we feel that it's run its course, it's just not interesting anymore. You know, we got it, tired it, of pain. We got tired yeah, of being tired. 
it's like this. You know, I, I remember as a young man and being single and everything, and I wanted to run around and chase girls and do the stuff that boys do. It's that moon in Gemini right there. That's right. <laughs> moon in Gemini. Well, whatever. And I wanted to do all that stuff. And then one day it just, I don't know what happened. It just got old. Yeah. And it's the same thing with suffering. It's the same thing with difficulty. It's like, okay, because, you know, I used to think of it like this. If I were a mountain climber, I'd want to climb El Capitan. Well, climbing El Capitan is tough. It's really tough, right? especially doing it without a rope. So let's just keep making it more and more challenging or let's go to the bottom of the ocean. I feel so bad for the families that were lost, you know, lost loved ones in that. It's a terrible story. But it, it also speaks somehow to the human condition, doesn't it? It's like, so you got all these billionaires who are like, what the hell else do I do with my money except for go to the bottom of the ocean in a giant pill that implodes, right? It's like, really? There's something kind of weird in that too, right? Something mm -hmm. very bizarre in that. So I start thinking to myself, I'm not, you know, this precision athlete or something. I was always athletic, but I'm not a precision athlete. I'm, but if I were... Would I choose the easy path? The answer is no, I wouldn't. I would choose the difficult path, the more challenging path. That's the nature of what I do. It's the, whether it's an invention or an art or music or mathematics, I always choose the difficult path. I've always chosen the difficult path. I've never chosen the easy path. No one ever gave me anything. People always say, oh, you have white privilege. I'm like, no, I didn't have any white privilege. From what you think of as privilege, I grew up poor. My family was not wealthy at all. In fact, quite the opposite. I paid for my own school. I, I did all my own work. And I know plenty of people who have been way more challenged. Like Helen Keller is a great example. Hmm. Who literally was a quadriplegic. She's deaf and blind. And yet she became an inspiration to tens of millions of people around the world. She didn't bitch about her ailments. She didn't bitch about her offenses and how she was offended at this or that. She empowered people. Hmm. She wasn't teaching more victimhood. She was teaching empowerment. And to me, there's something so powerful in that. So this concept that we have, right, where we think we have to suffer, I think that's now coming to the end for some people. And we don't need to suffer like that anymore. Yes. We can experience the love phase and, and experience the bliss phase of life. And I think that's what's going to happen now for lots and lots of people. And, and I think there's going to be a huge divide that's going to be happening for some people and other people are not going to have that at all. And I think we're going to move into this trifold mm. scenario. Mm where it's no longer going to be yin and yang, it's going to be yin, shen, yang. Shen is the kai, it's the sheen in Hebrew, which is the flame. It looks kind of like this, you know, like Spock, it's like live long and prosper. That's the shape of it. And I believe that this new stage is going to be people that transcend duality. It's a new consciousness that's arising. And you mentioned time, how we're beginning to experience time differently. Obviously, Einstein said it, time is relative. And you mentioned that time is the fourth dimension. And it's the only thing that's keeping us back from transcending to the fifth dimension. And we've heard a lot of talk in, the, in this spiritual consciousness mm -hmm. community of we are headed into a different dimension almost as we raise our consciousness. And I was having uh, in Cancun in Mexico, um, got invited to have dinner with Dr. Joe Dispenza and his whole team. And it was a beautiful experience. And I got to ask him some questions as well. And I asked him that question because it was the week, the whole retreat, this was the last day. And I felt that we were literally 2,000 people entering a spaceship and ascending our consciousness as a collective. And I almost asked him, like, will there be a point if these people gather and we start collectively ascending, 
will there be a you know the people that resist that new consciousness will we separate dimensionally that was something i couldn't wrap my head around and i asked him this question and i don't believe i had the awareness and the capacity to hold that response that he gave me so at that moment and i really wanted to ask you your perspective on it when it comes to dimensions time and consciousness all in one bucket you know it's interesting i was just doing a lot of study re recently on one of the paintings by leonardo da vinci mm -hmm. and it's called the adoration of the magi and a lot of art historians believe that it was an unfinished painting it was a commission that he was basically performing for and there are other paintings around that time that he did in a similar style where some of the people look transparent in the, in the painting. So they think it's unfinished. And some of them look just like a, a, like a pencil drawing. And they're flat. Like they don't really exist. And then the background of this particular painting, it's got Mary and, and Jesus. And she's holding Jesus and the three wise men, right, who are the magi who are giving gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And she's sitting in front of a palm tree and also uh, uh, another tree that's right behind her. I think it's a sycamore tree. And then also there's like buildings that are transparent. There's a, like a staircase going up. It looks like an Egyptian temple. One aspect of it, it has a column in it that's identical to the columns in the Temple of Esna in Egypt. And in the background, there's elephants and animals as well. It's like, what's going on? And then you see another scene where it looks like there's Greeks and Romans battling each other, riding horses. Hmm. And so people call this the unfinished painting. But actually, I don't believe that's the case at all. I believe that what Leonardo was doing was describing how he saw time space. Hmm. So now think about this. If you could sit in one location and watch it as if you could perceive all dimensions of time simultaneously, how would you describe it? Infinite. Infinite, right? So you might see visions of a place, like if you saw that movie Lucy. Yeah. Right? Where she was like sitting on that chair and all of a sudden she's seeing all the dimensions of time in that area of New York that she was in. Mm -hmm. Right? Went all the way back to like, you know, caveman and like dinosaurs and everything, and then came all the way back forward again to where she was in that time dimension. She was seeing and perceiving time in all dimensions at the same time. So how would you illustrate that? Maybe exactly the same way that da Vinci did. In one moment of time in the same location, there's elephants in the background and bulls and cows and all kinds of stuff. In another moment of time, there was a battle waged on that same spot. In another moment of time, there is a, an Egyptian temple that was there that now no longer stands. In another moment of time, it looked like, a, you know, a way in a manger. In another moment of time, it's a tree, a palm tree and then another tree. In another moment of time, there's Mary, the virgin, with her child, Jesus, and the three magi. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So experiencing time differently is because the way we're experiencing time right now is because of our persistent perception of duality. The ultimate duality is past and future. And yet, when you realize and understand physics, that in physics, there's an electron that has to be entangled to a positron that's in the future. That means that the future determines the past as much as the past determines the future. One is not better than the other. This is why I believe that destiny, what we call destiny, is really the free will of the higher self. It's all set. It's all predetermined. What we call different dimensions of space-time, and yes, there are infinite by our counting, because I could literally take each minute of me, and if I had a picture of me walking around this office, you'd see little versions of me all over my office at the same time, and everybody else all around it too. How would I draw that? How would I paint it? Probably the same way that Leonardo painted Adoration of the Magi. Hmm. And when we realize this, that time is the encryption to the higher dimensional experience, 
And the only thing that transcends time is love. So love, Buckminster Fuller refers to love as metaphysical gravity. It's the force that is invisible. It binds the universe together. In this context, it's kind of implosive. Gravity is implosive. Radiation is explosive. It's this feminine aspect that probably informs all the darkness of space-time. The stuff that we don't understand, we ascribe to the darkness. That's why we still don't fully understand gravity, not even close. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, yeah. And gravity and time are inextricably linked. If you saw the movie Interstellar, you know what I'm talking about. They landed on this planet that was next to the black hole that they were there for only 45 minutes, but 23 years had passed because of mass time dilation. Because the gravity on that surface was far greater than the gravity where their original ship was. So therefore time effects were very different. They experienced only a short amount of time. It's the concept of like a dream within a dream within a dream of inception. So this idea that gravity is inextricably linked to time is the subject of the transcendence of it. That the only way that you can transcend time is through this metaphysical gravity, which we call love. That keeps the entire universe bound in its place. And maybe the reason why it's dark to us is because it's just not understood. And again, awakening is the series of softenings and the series of openings that allows us to bring illumination to that which was dark or to illuminate into our awareness that which we did not previously understand. I believe that that's why enlightenment is literally when the expression of love that metaphysical gravity supersedes the desire. And I'm not saying the truth. I said supersedes the desire for truth. When, when the seeking ends. Love, when the seeking ends. And one day I had this big epiphany. One of my friends said to me, he's like, look, I had this epiphany, Robert. He said he went to this place called Hoffman, which was up in um, a lot of people go to this place. It's like a healing type place. They make you beat a pillow for like a week. You know, type thing. It's like intense. <laughs> it's super intense. <laughs> One of those communities. <laughs> One of those places. And, and he said while he was there, he realized that our world experience was not about seeking perfection. He was, uh, you know, one of these uh, very, very successful CEO type guys who never felt good enough. And I, I understand this. He had a tiger mom, kind of a mom who was Jewish, but he was like, you know, he was the Jewish American prince, you know, Prince of Bel Air type guy. And he was dealing with his own issues and trauma. And he said, he goes, I had a big epiphany while I was at Hoffman. I said, what is it? He said, I spent my whole life seeking perfection. And now I realize the arc of my life is to see it as it is. And I think I used to think the same thing. You know, here I was, I was president of a company called Allergan Medical. I launched Botox and Juvederm and all, all these really cool like aesthetic products and everything. And my goal in life at that time was, okay, I'm going to make the world see that they can actually embody whatever it is that they want. So you can realize your, as in possessive, your ideal, whatever your ideal is. And now I realize the arc of my life has shifted, but it's still the same words. Realize your ideal just became realize you are ideal. Hmm. You're already ideal. You no longer have to seek it. And once you stop seeking it, that idealism, that wondrous, amazing experience, starts to manifest in your life. The things we seek, I think there's one thing that I'm having a hard time reconciling. The seek and ye shall find, part of the Bible. Mm. Because actually, what I've learned has been quite the opposite. 
The things I continue to seek or I put on a message board or I put on a vision board and I place it on a vision board because I want those things. They might be material successes. They might be recognition. They might be whatever it is. It doesn't matter. But as soon as I place it on that vision board, I've separated myself from it. It gets further from you. It gets further from me. Hmm. What I've learned, if anything, about manifestation, it is that the way to manifest is to already embody having achieved it. So I used to buy watches. You probably heard the story about me buying watches and I would collapse space time and I would look at watches and every time I would buy a new watch, right? Because I collected all these watches. There would be a story about that watch. Mm. Well, this watch has a story. I'll tell you the story. I've never told it before. This watch is kind of unique because it's got an X and Y axis that are belts. Yeah. You see it? It's yeah, kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. It charges on a base, but I had left this in a briefcase that I shoved in a drawer that I forgot about. I thought I lost the watch. Now the base was a charging base that was like a induction base. And you put it on there at night type of thing, and then it would charge and those things would turn. It kind of made this weird noise, but it was cool. I don't know, it was kind of a weird thing. Well, while I thought that this watch was lost, I threw away the base. Base was gone. Mm. It was big and bulky. I'm like, what am I going to do with this thing? I don't have the watch anymore. So then I find the, the watch. Well, lo and behold, the company went out of business during COVID. So I have no way to charge this watch. Huh. So I can't really use it as an old watch. So then you're probably saying, you're wearing a broken watch? Well, it's right two times a day. <laughs> yeah. But I'm wearing it for a different reason. Because time stopped. And I realized all the blissful moments I've ever had have been those moments when time stopped. And as a romantic, I would seek out those moments. The first time I went to Paris, you know, I was walking around the city and time stopped. I was on the Bateau Mouche, this incredible boat, and this girl was taking me down the Seine, and she's explaining to me Paris, and it was so beautiful, every aspect of it. And I'm like, wow, time freaking stopped. Then I realized my first kiss, you know, time stopped. Or when I go into a really awesome restaurant, it's got the right ambiance and the right music. It's not even only about the food. It's all of those things. Time stops. When I'm in a symphony listening to the most incredible you know, Philharmonic Orchestra, play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, time stops. And I recognize in that moment the bliss of existing, the wonder of life. So now I've decided it's time for time to stop. So that's why I'm wearing a broken watch. Hmm. You've entered the fifth dimension. Hmm. And I want to go back to when you were 11. You're in a forest in England. Yep. Uh -huh. And you come across these beings that you call the Arcturians. And you call them the future humans. So I'm really curious about that experience that you had coming across these beings and really understanding that were they future humans coming back to us now? Are these... ET beings coming now to assist humanity, uh, guide us into the new era. How do you see that whole process? As we ascend, not only does the future change, but one cannot change without the past also changing. So this is where we get Mandela effects from. There are millions of people that believe they watched Nelson Mandela's funeral for several hours on TV. There are millions of people that believe that Darth Vader said, Luke, I am your father. He never said that. Hmm. There are millions of people that believe there was something called Jiffy peanut butter. And yet it was always Jiff. Huh. So what is happening as we are up leveling our consciousness, 
all the things that, and they could be small artifacts that seem totally meaningless and unimportant, are actually changing your past. So the future doesn't only change when you get on a new path. The past also changes. How does that work? That's that's something I it's I struggle to wrap wrap my mind around it's my a, linear it, mind around. It's a frequency just like the Mandela effect, and so people have phantom memories hmm. collectively of things that didn't exist because the new frequency they were in changed the track of that history. History, in fact, can change, and I give you an easy example of that. You've probably had a bad experience happen to you sometime in your life before, right? Yeah. You've had a bad experience happen and you're know, like, that was the worst thing that ever happened. And then maybe a few months later or a year later or two years or three years later, you look back on it and say, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. You just changed history. The polarity of your perception was impacted by the time arc. And time has a way of doing that. What we see one way can entirely change another. So collectively, we call that history. So history can change. In fact, it must for the future to change. Both must change. So I think what we're seeing now is humanity up levels its consciousness. This is why all the 5D elements of our history are now starting to come back into the world, into new discovery. Uh, like Atlantis, like yes. New, like Lemuria. Yes. They said yes. that those civilizations were operating at a different frequency and now we're just beginning to remember so if it was all at a different frequency then how could we remember it Ooh. if we're not at that frequency you see my point mm. so this is why there's this huge awakening now of all this ancient civilization stuff that was lost because it was of a higher order frequency and we have to be in that higher order frequency to perceive its even existence you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If I'm in the second dimension and an apple falls through my world, I'm only going to see slices of that apple falling through my world. I'm not going to perceive an apple because how do I describe, even without the words of the third dimension, what the concept of depth is? It's not possible. So if we've got this concept of an advanced civilization in our history and our linear thinking is that mankind went from hunter-gatherer to all these different stages of advancement, and how could we have been more advanced at some point in time in the past? Well, that even happens in fractals within, right? I mean, it was Pythagoras that figured out that the world was a sphere. And Aristosthenes figured out that it had seven degree, seven degree arc. And Pythagoras knew that it was 40,000 kilometers as its circumference. He actually knew that. They didn't use the term, but in their unit of measure, it was equivalent to what 40,000 kilometers is because he figured out as well the same thing Aristosthenes figured out. Aristotle's just proved it by a little test that he did in Thebes and, and up in Alexandria with two poles of the same length casting shadows. Hmm. So, and they were 800 kilometers apart, right? Or 500, 800 kilometers apart. So basically the thing is, is that we are now becoming awakened to all the aspects of our history that were in higher dimension because we are moving into higher dimension. Wow. So as we move into higher dimension, then we start to also experience other entities and beings of higher dimension. Arcturians are just future humans that have entered into higher dimension. They are transcendent of what we call time. Many of them are six dimensional. Yeah. Often born into fifth dimensional, but they go into six dimensional. And their whole goal as well is to continue to expand the same way that the one universe expands by raising its consciousness. They have a council called the Jed, the Jedi. All these things are just permeated throughout our art and culture to bring us back to these messages through this gentle awakening. The awakening that we experience now is not going to be one of a stark alarm that hits us in the morning, like smacks us upside the head. It's like one of those... Alarms that have the curtains raised slowly so that you can see the natural sunlight. Huh. So there are many different species and experiences as we all expand our consciousness 
This will just become part of the next evolution. If you're a grasshopper, the field is your universe. If you're a monkey, the forest that you live in is your universe. You may never have seen a man before. You may not even know they exist. You might have heard from another monkey that, hey, there's men over there across that hill hmm. in Colombia, but you've never seen the man. When you see him, you might think that's like a weird looking monkey. Yeah. He's like an alien. Yeah, it's like right? they got footage from an uncontacted tribe in the Amazon and exactly. they, fl they flew a drone over them and you see them like, like just like what is that you know and and it's that you know we we can only see what we believe is real in our in our purview in our current reality we don't see the world as it is we see it as we are one of my favorite movies i watched in college was this movie called the gods must be crazy where like a plane was flying over like the serengeti and they someone kicks out a coke bottle from the plane yeah a coke bottle lands and the bush people that were there get the Coke bottle. It becomes like this magic item for them. Right? It's like this whole thing with so much deep significance. Everyone's fighting over this Coke bottle. And this is the point, right? We have no clue what we don't know. The realm of, you know, I just studied this whole thing in mathematics called Ramsey numbers, which is basically supposed to help us define. There was a big article in Quantum Magazine about it this week. It's supposed to help us define this concept of randomness. But then as soon as you start to define the concept of randomness, you find that there's actually pattern within the randomness that we didn't think was there. And I've been saying this all along. There's no such thing as randomness. There's only a perception of randomness, which is really a, the only way that we can describe, because of our, our delicate egos, what ignorance is. Randomness is simply ignorance of pattern that exists. It's God's encryption. Until we start to transcend it and understand. So you could be that grasshopper or that monkey, or you're now going to live in rural Alabama somewhere. You've never traveled anywhere. You don't know what it's like that there are people that speak, you know, in, in Botswana or people that are from Swaziland. You've never met them. You may have heard about them, but you don't. They may never exist. It could all be fake. You've never been to the moon, so maybe the whole thing was faked. Then you come back in another incarnation and you are a metropolitan adventurer. You've been to everywhere in the world. You speak tons of languages. You have lots and lots of broad experiences and you've been very, very well educated. What's the next step beyond that? You know that there are people in Swaziland. You know that there's a tribe of, you know, Eskimos of, uh, you know, that, that are in the Inuit, right? That are in Alaska. So what's the next step of that expansion of flora and fauna and diversification of consciousness, it might be intraterrestrial. Mm. I say intraterrestrial because they've been here all along. It's us that we think we're separate again, and we have not perceived them because we've not been at the vibration necessary to perceive. Yeah. And even that is interesting because when you go back to the Sumerian tablets, they do speak of another race living amongst humanity and as you said the arcturians the arcturians the atlanteans they helped bring the pyramids forward the knowledge that we have about the pyramids it's almost like they were leaving behind information for us to now begin to unlock um thoth you talk so extensively about thoth and the emerald tablets he or this being that was living in that time many different varieties many different forms mm -hmm. he left behind a lot of information that we're just now beginning to uncover and you probably hold a record for nights spent at the pyramid <laughs> I've, done, and, I've done 13 nights at the pyramid but unfortunately i just realized i'm gonna have to go because i have another appointment now but um it's been such a pleasure we can schedule another time too to continue the conversation but um i've really enjoyed talking with you and i hope you have a wonderful weekend Amazing. Do you have time for one last question? Very quick. Very quick. All right. This is called the time capsule question. We end every podcast with it. Mm -hmm. It You have to travel a little bit out into the future for it. And this is an allegory. So basically, you are given the opportunity to have a time capsule, your own personal time capsule. And you can leave behind um, in this time capsule anything of your imagination, knowing that this 
time capsule is going to be opened by the next generation of leaders that are going to be heading into this new age and you're going to be able to equip them with all the tools necessary information knowledge wisdom that you'd like inside this be? time capsule what would it be the great pyramid <laughs> yeah we got it we got to do a round two robert just talk about that <laughs> the great pyramid of the giza plateau is exactly that time capsule you're talking about yeah, because uncovering and studying that and understanding it brings to light all the wisdom of ages that were commensurate in a, in a soft way through the series of softenings mm. of, of an age and period of time that was outside of our conscious awareness and history. Mm. And it's imbued with all of the knowledge that we need to ascend. Robert, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. I, I know I have a feeling in my heart that we're going to do this again. And we, we will a, absolutely do it again. A lot of wisdom to uncover. So thank you so much for your thank wisdom, you. your time. And we'll, st we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.